boys, listen, we're getting together again. It's going to be another summit in San Francisco. First time we've ever done two summits in the same place, like right away, you know. So what's that? In a row. In a row. Boom, boom. Bada bing, bada boom. Double header. Yeah. (laughs) Two-headed snake. (laughs) So listen, uh, the dates are... So the dates of the next summit is January 7th, 8th, and 9th. Uh, January 2022, 7th, 8th, and 9th. Uh, the plan is to plan on arriving uh, Thursday the 6th, uh, just for pre, pre-summit activities. And then uh, if you can, please stay for a, f- uh, a few additional days, um, the following Monday, Tuesday, and even up to Wednesday, You know, we're probably going to get, you know, may go into some other little bonus activities and bonus adventures and maybe, you know, go out sailing or something like that. Adventure. Adventure. Yeah. Yeah. You got (laughs) to, got to remember, we got some adventure coming. So, so that would be, uh, so definitely plan on arriving on this January 6th and staying all the way, you know, till the 12th if possible. Uh, But if you got to leave earlier, it's understandable. But uh, for those that can stay the entire time, I think it would definitely be well worth it. And I'll try to explain it so you guys who haven't been, you can understand that. uh, Actually, Luke was saying, uh, Mr. Smith, not Mr. Smith, uh, sorry. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong Wong said something very... Mr. Wong is never wrong. He very (laughs) influenced, interesting. He said that before he came to his first summit, he didn't know, you know, he just knew the dates. He thought it was going to be like a regular event where it's boring and it's scheduled, well, it's, it's planned. Boring. It's um, yeah. more like um, very formal where you go into a, um, a room and you go and someone presents something on a monitor and then you just do some talks. And right. then after that, we get to go, you know, tour by myself and, and the city. So right. the first time it was in Japan. And then after we showed up, it was very informal. You just, you know, kind of talk like this regular guy and we're just hanging out. And then you kind of took us around like a tour guide so it was great so that was a very introduction to japan which i wanted to go and that's why i wanted to go over there and you know hang out and well not hang out but just go there for an event and then i could go sightseeing it's like two birds with one stone because you could go to japan see tokyo and also meet everybody at the summit well actually it was a guided tour you were like the guided tour guide so that's what it felt like to me. Okay. It was okay. everything was very, very nice. Oh. He showed me around and I was going to do that on my own with a map, but I didn't have to do that. You already, t- I, you know, you took me, you took us around and show us the different places and you hung out. We went to the park and so oh, you're just like a. It was the best. Yeah. You're just Tokyo like, Summit was awesome. And, and then, you know, so and then while that was yeah, happening, was kind of weaving, kind of like. Uh, at the right times, weaving to uh, weaving in the different discussions and conversations, you know, uh, that when, when the guys, time is right, when yeah, we when feel the time was right. they yeah. say, you know, what Stephen King said in his book, he said, when the muse is on your shoulder, right? When the muse is there, it's like it's like this magical being that he, it inspires him to write creative, unique books, exactly. And it's not always there, he, the same guy can sit down and write all day, but if the muse is not on his shoulder, he just throws it away. Because he knows it's just not coming. It's not here. I'm the same way. So when we're going around and, and we're talking and everybody's asking questions and I can feel the vibe, all of a sudden I realize what needs to happen. Like, boom. And then we, boom, sit down here. We do it. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. oh, here's this. Oh, man, right here. Look at that. That beautiful tree and this little scene and setting right now. This is where we're going to sit down and have our meeting right now. And it's like, boom. You know, and, like, and it just kind of happens organically yeah. like that. What I liked about it is a lot like improv. You know, it just happens. Yeah. And you just talk and you don't plan anything. And then one thing leads to another. And then you just string the day together. It was... Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, and people absorb the kind of ideas. And they start talking about what happened in the last, yeah. say, say, conversation. And everybody's talking. And then those ideas, like that book, When Ideas Have Sex... The ideas together create new questions, new perspectives, and then that usually paves the way for the next discussion. So it kind of like, that's why each summit's so different, because the discussions and the ideas and the people are so different, right? right. Each time. So, yeah, so what I, I got out of it is not scripted. It's, you know, it's, it's not it's, scripted. It's not scripted. So I didn't, you know, it's not going to plan. I, we're going to go do this at one, two, three, or four. Yeah. You know, like it's not written down. Yeah. So we just kind of go 
as... I mean, yeah, I mean, basically the only thing that might be, like, slightly formal is just, like, our morning meeting where we just sit down and we just have a uh, an open discussion and each person introduces themselves and their story of what brought them here. Stuff like that, Stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Like, that's... The, and that's, that's the only really structured part. Everything else is kind of like, okay, we... It's about just having cool spaces and bringing cool guys together and just letting it organically unfold, you know, in, and, and, in the and, best but, way possible. But okay. you're right, because that first meeting is when you get to know people's really what they're going through, their needs. So that's where I get, that's where I get the idea. That's where I get the inspiration. That's where the muse, muse comes. I'm listening to people share and I'm like, oh my God, they don't know this or he doesn't know. We got to get, oh, we got to go this way. You know, right. and so it's kind of forming as I'm listening. That's why the introductions, like honest, you know, you know, like really raw introductions are the best. And the guys, I would say the guys who have the worst time at summits, if there is such a thing, would be the guys who are too scared to talk in the beginning. And so yeah. they yeah. their voice never gets heard because it's not until too late they realize how important that was, you know. Each time to share, like when, like when Gabe comes, it's like each time Gabe is a new guy, he's in a new situation. And he learned, like I kind of saw him learn that at first he thought, okay, I did it once, right? I, I'm done. But then he realized each time he comes, he's in a different phase now. He's doing new things. And so he's got to say, like, don't repeat the old story. This is one thing I hate about groups like AA is that one thing I just despise yes. is people tell the same story. It becomes very stale and a very old and very boring, it and there's like no life. Like an endless it, it, loop. Well, yeah. no, it, it almost becomes right. like that becomes their identity. And it's like, I thought they joined the program to overcome that. And instead, the thing that brought them to it is the very thing that's keeping them trapped. Well, it's like, it, 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 it's like when you first tell a, a story. When I, that's why I don't repeat my stories that much. Like a lot of stories I still haven't even said yet. Mm-hmm. I'm in the jet, you know, because I don't want to ruin them. Because I know that if I talk too many times in stories, I will. I don't know. There's some spiritual rule here where you lose the juice is gone, you know. Right. And that's why I don't like most speakers. Like when I've, I've spoken at many events, and I've been on like I've done a lot of speaking in different kinds of situations, and every speaker I know is like that. They always do the same speech. They know what they're going to say. They planned it out. And that sounds very logical, you know, especially to a man. You're like, I'm going to the event. I got to prepare. But I never do. I never do. Even when I speak in business settings, I come and I listen. And I'll even think, I'll even say sometimes, look, I plan, like I did an event in Vancouver. And I was like, I got there and I said, look, I plan to talk about this. But I can see that, you know, because I thought they were all corporate people. But it turns out they weren't. They were all freelancers. So I went in a total different direction. And it was like, when the event ended, this lady came up and she goes, he was the star of this event. She goes, he was the guy that was the biggest surprise. He was the dark horse. Nobody expected him to be a good, you know, to, to change the event. And it really went. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do this forever. Because I've always done it in these, you know, groups like this. But in business, I didn't. But I think it's a very powerful thing in business, too. Because what people do is they decide what they're going to say. And then they say it, regardless of whether they find out you don't need it. Or you already know that. And they're scared to change. And I think, it, I think the basic thing is have faith in yourself that you have more to give than a memorized speech. You're more than just the story that you think is your story. There's more under the surface. Like at the summits, the more questions are asked, the better it gets. Right. Because there's more under there. Because we're not full of shit. That's the amazing thing about the group. Like if you go deep and you keep asking... People will come up with stuff because we're not faking it. Yeah, it's yeah. very authentic. Yeah, this is a very authentic. And, there, and there's deep, like we're not just talking shit. This is not just a chance to get together. It's like this is a chance to learn and to put new ideas together. That's what we do at each event. It's to put new ideas together for ourselves, and for me too. I have to keep myself fresh and say, wait a second, I can't be this guy. Maybe some guys want me to be, right? But that will kill me. Mm-hmm. And fuck that. That's not why I'm doing this thing. I, I started this thing because I'm like, I want to go deeper in life. Oh, so and how, deeper and deeper. So how did you begin this channel? 
Okay, how did I begin? Yeah, how did, how did I, it start? Actually, yeah. actually, it's a great question there, high five. <laughs> you got it right on the minute. It's exactly what we're going to talk about, the beginnings. And actually, Alex about had new some, beginnings. Mr. Smith has some great questions here. So, yeah, I mean, we were thinking about just the whole idea of new beginnings. Yeah. But it's like, in order to have a new beginning, sometimes it's good to pause and reflect back on how you began the current, you know, the, the, the current path that you're on. Like, how did that path begin and reflect on that? Because then just, I think sometimes sharing how you began, you know, to, to exp- kind of tells the story of how you got to where you are now, that also kind of informs and helps other guys as they're at a turning point in their life and they're ready for a new beginning for themselves. Or, or to create a business. Or to create or a business. To a YouTube channel. New YouTube channel, or yeah. Or, 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 or like recreate, like reinvent themselves in some way. Right. And I think that's also the, the, I feel like it's good to have like a little bit of a theme for this new, this, uh, upcoming summit you know it's right after new year's and it's just like you know new beginnings right a few and episodes ago you said this channel was about five years old now yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. Did that, yeah so i'm interested so in that oh, back then back. that was him face you yeah. were facing a new beginning five years ago so how was that like the, what was that like before i answer because huh. because mr smith and i talked about this i want to say first before i told you how it begun how did you think, thought, how did you think that it begun? Like, what was your impression of the channel? Like, you asked questions wondering, oh, but you had... Oh, a, I, you, oh, 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 okay, okay, I see what you're saying, okay. Back to the past, I didn't know it was fine. So my questions right off the bat, when I, I was talking to Ronan earlier today, and I was like, wh- what made you think of, like, calling your channel Ronan Man? Like, what was it, what was the impetus for that? You know, like I see Ronan and I get it. I, I see I'm like, okay, Ronan. It's like a samurai who lost his master. And, but I'm just like, and I was trying to understand like what was, and there's Ronan and then man. And then, and then like your style of walking around and all that stuff. Like what, yeah, where did that start? Cause, and how did you, did you just come it up with yourself it's or did you like get there. other people to help you kind of figure it out? Cause there's a lot of people you know, myself included, have been thinking about wanting to do some online, you know, create a channel, yeah. create a new kind of online persona, that kind of thing. And it's just like, when do you know that you picked the right thing and, and it just worked, you know? So I was curious, like, how did that actually start for you? And it was, I think it was when you were telling me about the different places you lived, you know, where you lived in Japan and, and, and in so China, and China then you ended up living in Thailand and stuff. And then it was like the stuff that happened to you later in Thailand is what. Well, well the, 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 the main thing, I mean, where it started was when my business was stolen in China. Mm. That was really the beginning because I, I had finally done one thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to build a business with employees and an office and like, uh, like a machine. Like the Tesla, they always say the machine that makes the machine, right? Yeah. So the, he made the factory is one of the key things in Tesla, right? I wanted to make a machine. I wanted, I wanted to have not just, because before I had done consulting and I had been successful, but it always had been me. And when I tried to bring other people on, it didn't really work. Sometimes they would make money, but they were them, right? It wasn't together. You know, they would do deals and I would do deals. And we would make money, but it wasn't a machine. It wasn't like a company where it all like works, like the wheels are greased. And everything works. Like the girl shows into work. She clocks in. She goes to the front. She cleans the counter. You know, the other guy's in the back. He bakes the bakery. You know, like it all where the truck comes in. Oil machine. Yeah, like a machine. So I kind of wanted to build that, right? And so when I went to China, I built that. But then once I built that, when I lost it, I thought, okay, what can I learn from this? And I thought, I don't, like I didn't know what it was going to be like. To have a machine. Like, I didn't know. To be the boss. But you didn't experience that long enough because you didn't, you know, run it for at least a year or two to know no, everything's no, no, going no, we good. Had going for, oh, you had- we were going for probably eight years. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Eight years. Probably eight oh, years. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was there 10 years and we had tried a couple businesses. We, I started a supplement company. I bought a bunch of pill making machines and I was doing resveratrol pills, which is basically the ingredients in red wine to keep you young. And right. So I really believed in respiratory. I still do. So I started making these pills. And long story, this guy was a total scumbag. So I decided not to do that business. And I tried, uh, you know, different ideas. I had a bunch of, so I was kind of thinking of stuff. 
and then and then then the real estate you know basically i ran out of money so i had no money i basically i came there with hundreds of thousands of dollars but you had it and then Eight year business it was very stable that was or generating income but even as i started there was this, i'm just telling the story so i it's interesting too because i i had tried these businesses and i spent a lot of money on these businesses so and i had lost like a quarter of a million dollars in japan on a toy business so i was really i had been putting all this money in these businesses and it was like painful i've been losing and losing and losing so and you trying to run a business to make money to start other startups and I, create other businesses while you're having a stable business and using that revenue to do something on the side. Yeah, basically, I you know that's why I took my head earning money and then I put it in the toy business. I put it into you know uh, to to get into investment in real estate. I needed a lot of money because I had to pay my bills while I was working, you know, to do a deal. Right. So I basically then when I got to China, I tried these other businesses and I had done a bunch in Japan too just before I left and I had lost a lot of money. So you know anybody who you know, who hasn't had a business, you have to understand that when they say nine out of 10 businesses fail, they don't mean losers. They mean everybody. Like nine out of 10 businesses fail in the first five years. And nine out of those, 10 of those businesses fail in the next five years. So the odds are really hard. You have to be ready to start many businesses. Yeah. So there's no magic formula to find the thing that works. You got to be the bull who just keeps going, like raging bull. You know, Robert De Niro in that movie. You just got to be the raging bull. You're going to do one. You're going to do another. You're going to try this. If this doesn't work, you're going to do that. So I tried these things. Then when I got to China, I ran out of money. So I was like, I was at the end of the, uh, like a cul-de-sac. I had only $5,000 left. And I had a girlfriend who was pretty good at business. She was good. She was able to get things done. And and, and I said, and she's like, what are we going to, she trusted me at the time. She totally trusted She said, what, what are we going to do? Like, even though we had done these things, we had failed. She was also a business person and she could see that I was, you know, I call it like, like I'm shooting to kill. Right? I'm just, I'm like a sniper. I'm shooting and I'm just barely missing. She's like, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. I'm like, okay. So she had the same mindset as I did. Right. So I was like, she, was she Chinese? She was Chinese. Yeah. So I said, uh, she said, what are we going to do now? And it was like, she was just, you know, at the time she was very innocent. I was like, she trusted me. I'm like, okay, what are we going to do? And I said, fuck it. What we're going to do is we're going to rent a big apartment and we're going to rent out the rooms and make a small profit. Because I got $5,000 left. That's enough to rent an apartment. You didn't give mm-hmm. up. And I, yeah, so I rented an apartment. And I remember the night we started, we, went, we rented this big apartment. It was real pretty like this. It was right next to like a real nice area. And it, was, it wasn't as nice as this apartment, but it was great view. The view was even, it was awesome. It was a great place. And it was a great deal for five thousand dollars for including the down payments and everything. So we got in there, place was empty, we had no hope. We felt so scared, both of us, because I spent all my money. Like to get the down payment so and so everything. Like, so we're sitting in there broke. So it's like chasing the American dream and this is your last chip. Well, I think the Chinese dream is the same, you know. Yeah. They're very entrepreneurial in China. So yeah. It's more like That's the Chinese dream. Like, yeah. yeah. It sounds like you're it was, trying to chase a dream. You yeah. had the highs and you're almost at the lows and you went up and down and now you're at the last chip. Yeah. Last yeah. chip. Yeah, yeah, you push your last chip yeah. in. Yeah. The I last another, bet. Yeah. I, I, Black I, or red. Black yeah. or red. I, and, and the thing is, I thought I had another $115,000 in this account in Japan. But it's a long story. I didn't know I'd been using this credit card and then it had been taking that down. And I didn't, it wasn't supposed to, the, the card wasn't supposed to take the money out of that account, but it was. So I suddenly found out that money wasn't there. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh shit, that money's not there. So I'm like, I had 5,000, I rented the apartment. And then, and then she said, well, how are we gonna, and I said Craigslist, because Craigslist was brand new then. Nobody was using Craigslist in China, like nobody, zero. I said, we're gonna put these, apart, these, uh, these rooms in Craigslist. Because I heard about Craigslist. Because I was in China too. I didn't know about Craigslist. But it turns out that was the brilliant move. Because we put them in Craigslist and like without paying any commissions, with no ads. The next day, we had like 10 people come over to look at our rooms. And we only had two other rooms because it was a three-bedroom. And we were using one. We were living oh, in the apartment. You needed a place to live too. Yeah. We needed a place to live. Yeah. We had no more money. I had no more money. So that was it. We had to live in there. And then they, and they came in and nobody was sublessing because it was technically illegal in China. But also, they did it, but it was for poor people. But China was getting expensive, so it was changing. So it was kind of, everything was perfect timing. 
which we did sometimes luck, right? So anyway, the guys come in, and I remember Fabio comes in, this Italian guy, Fabio, Fabio. He comes in, and he's like, he's like, Paul, Paul. He says, thank you so much. I love it. Nobody's renting the room. I'm happy, you know. And he was like making Italian food and stuff. And it was like a really good vibe. And there was, I forgot the girl's name came, but there was a couple people. And then, and so I'm like, wow. And then, and then she had this like, she was very aggressive. She was more of a risk taker. Your girlfriend. Yeah. She was more of a risk taker than me. And as soon as we had the place rented the next day, she's like, we need another apartment. Yeah. And I was like, I don't think we're ready. I, right. cause like the light, the night before we're poor and now we're going to get another apartment somehow. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't think, I don't know. But I, actually, there's one funny thing, too. The night we were sitting there, when we rented the apartment, I'm looking out, and I'm kind of in despair, because I had had, I'd made a lot of money, and I'm in China, and now it's gone. It's feeling scary. You know, I don't get scared too easily, but I'm like, fuck, you know. I couldn't afford the rent on the place, you know. And I'm like, fuck, what if nobody comes? I got 30 days. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, things could get rough here. And, and so then... Uh, I had went to the store and I had bought, uh, you know, my vegetables and everything. So I had these red peppers, bell peppers, but they, I, they're usually not hot in China. But these bell peppers were different. These were the hottest ghost peppers you've ever had in your fucking life. They were so insanely hot. I could not believe it. So I didn't know. So I cleaned them and I took a big bite out of them. And, <laughs> and the thing was just so fucking hot. But it was even worse than my mouth. What, my, I mean, my gums were on fire. Like, everything was on fire. And I was used to really hot food, too. Like, I had a real taste for hot. And, and my, my hands started burning. And then I touched my neck, and my neck was just burning on fire. And I washed my hands. I touched something else. And then my eye was burning. And I washed my hands like 10 times. Everything was burning. I touched. And, and, then, and then I thought, okay, we need good luck in this business. So I got to fuck this girl, you know, this first night in this apartment. So I... So, <laughs> I, so I take her. Time, so my eyes burning, my throat's burning, my hands are burning. My and, and I and I and I started to fuck her. What happened was, I grabbed my dick when I stuck oh, her no! in. Oh, and no, so and so she's like, she's like ah, and so she's burning. Oh. And so she's like screaming, like she's like in serious pain. Yeah, this girl was tough. Oh, yeah. She was when she screamed. It was not like some. Like, like pussy American girl. Like, she was tough, this girl. She was tough. Like, really. She's much tougher than most men here as far as, like, survival. This girl, oh, she grew up in the poorest part of China. She, she was tough. And her parents' house got bulldozed by the government. You know, she almost died because she didn't have a dollar twenty-five medicine. She was tough. So she's like, she's like, ah, she's like, ah, ah. And I'm like, I got to come. We got to finish this. <laughs> For good luck. So she's in pain. Yeah, so I'm like, because it was already too late. So I'm like, so I fucked her. And then she's like, she's like, I got to the hospital. And I'm like, we can't afford it. Like, you know, you know, and she's like, I know, I know. What are we going to do? And I'm like, what are we going to tell them? They, you know, they didn't like when foreigners had sex with Chinese girls anyway. So if I came in there with her, they would be like, so I knew this is going to be a nightmare in the hospital. Oh it's hard to explain if you haven't lived in another country. Like, they, like oh, I was cooking. There's a lot of stuff sudden. going on. Yeah, so then, so anyway, we survived that. She survived that. And, 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 and then uh, the business took off. And so it kind of took off. And I built what I built. And I was happy. And I felt like, you know, I totally changed my life. Like, I, from being, like, the, kind of the moment when I realized that I had done something great. Because sometimes you don't know, right? You do something, you don't know what it means. Like, as a young man, you have no fucking idea. No. What's going to happen? Like when you met your wife or girlfriend, when you start doing stuff or you start a business, you don't know you're going to do this for 20 years. You have no idea. Right. You know, there's no meaning almost, you know. And so uh, I, I was like, uh, oh, fuck, what was I going to say? And now I forgot the story. Um, any, anyway, God, I'll think of it. I'll think of it. It's important. So how long did it take to build this new business from the day you started renting that apartment oh no no oh wait wait let me let me wait wait let me finish that i just heard so what with the really the time when i realized my life had changed was i was at a real estate i was my friend of mine visited peter from australia and he was a real estate guy in japan and he said hey he said hey there's a real estate event it's a real high-end thing i know you don't usually go to these things because i was always considered myself i grew up poor i i've never been like uh I never was like a Harvard type of guy. I was never, you know what I mean? Like I just didn't relate to the educated, uh, the higher education. I, I had a college degree, 
from a state school. You know what I mean? I, I just, my parents, it's hard to explain, but I never thought of myself as like, I was different, you know. Uh, intellectual. Into, I was not intellectual. And I always was kind of looked down upon because I was very physical, sports and stuff. And so people never, the jock. they didn't yeah. think of me as, ah, I wasn't a jock. I wasn't like that. I wasn't like a letter guy. But I was just like, I was more into my own thing, whatever it was. You know, we did a lot of crazy rock climbing and, you know, we had a lot of adventures. Like, I was always into adventures. I, I, I haven't even told you my adventures. Like, I had some crazy adventures in high school. Uh, they're pretty good stories, actually. But anyway, so then I, I, I went to this event. Peter got me to go. He got me a ticket. And we're sitting there. And so there's all these, like, corporate real estate guys there. And I'm, like, this small real estate company. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm sitting there. And then I'm asking questions. And I said, you know, I said something like, so, you know, are you guys, you know, I asked a question. I shouldn't say the question because you might figure it out. So I asked a question. And then everybody in the mean, room goes, wait, you're doing what? Because I asked him how to do it better. And they're like... Sharing, doing sharing rooms. Yeah, because... Like renting mean, out, a, you know... Well, no, room, no, no, I, I, no. I don't want to say it wasn't that. It was, I, it was, the business had moved way past that. Oh, okay. That. By now, we had 50 apartments. We were selling apartments. We were leasing. We were property management. We were doing all kinds. We were selling overseas. We were doing crazy shit. It was... It was we had 700 maids. We were already, like, doing a lot of shit. That so the beginning. That, it was well, pretty, that pretty fast. Was that eight years in? No, that was like no, 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 no. That was only like that was probably four years in. Wow. When you're at this real estate, yeah, at this yeah. event. Okay. And then I said, you know, how do you, you know, I was wondering, like, when I do this, sometimes I have some trouble with it. It's kind of hard, you know. And then I was wondering, like, you guys are like professionals, so how do you handle this? And the and the guy goes, he he was he was super cool actually. The guy he goes, uh, <clears throat> he goes, honestly, none of us are doing what you're doing. Oh, like yeah. like he goes he goes you're doing yes. something. That we all want to do. Oh. Oh. And I was like, I was like, what? And he's like, so you don't he's, know where you're. yeah, I had no idea. Cause he, the, the way they do real estate, the, the corporate real estate guys, they're not really, it's, it's, it's all handed to them on a silver platter. They're just doing little sections. Like what we were doing was like hardcore stuff, like straight from the bottom. And we were like, we were like kicking ass too. So when the meeting, when the, when the, when the summit or the convention ended, they all got in line, all the speakers and like all the guys. And there's like a hundred people in line to get my card. I ran out of cards and I'm just handing them like all these guys are like, and, and Suddenly you became, yeah, the expert. yeah. And they were kind of kissing my ass. I was like, I, I was not used to, it. I was like, what the fuck? You know, I was kind of embarrassed. Like I want to go to the bathroom or something. I was like, and I'm just like, Oh, thanks. You know, you didn't know what happened. That's yeah. Like I didn't, then I realized afterwards, I'm like, wow, maybe I, I mean, we're onto something. And I realized we were the only ones in China doing what we were doing. And, and it was like kind of like, like the thing to do, right? So then mm. that was when I realized, okay, I am going somewhere, right? So yeah. the business went up and, you know, the girl ended up stealing the business and all that. But, and a lot of people would say, well, that was a failure, but it wasn't a failure at all because all these things I learned and, you know, my, my whole level of prestige was way up high because I had done stuff now. I've, I've, I'm, I know that I'm fucking capable of doing stuff. Yeah, so so I'm no longer the same person I was before. Right. Like, you know what I mean? No one can put me down and say, you can't do this. I'm like, I'm like I think about it. I, I, I'm realistic. I mean, I'm not saying I can do anything, but I'm like, you know what? I bet I could do you that. You came up with a new yeah. idea. You know, a new... Yeah, you know, a, a new idea. You came up with a new idea and you got it to grow. Yeah. And you were successful. If yeah. they didn't take it away from you, you'd be still doing the same thing right now. Right, and right. it's still in my blood. Like, it's right. something I did. And so that was a very cool thing. So, but, but at the same time, when the business, when I lost the business, I also thought to myself, I thought, wait, let me think. Do I really want to do this? Because most of the salesmen that work for us, they weren't that fun to talk to. And I didn't like being a boss. Like, I'm not a very good boss. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, not a, I'm a good motivator. I'm, I'm very good at selling an idea, you know, like, for example, a concept, you know, so people can understand a concept. And I'm very good at that. I'm very good at motivating people. All my life, people said, I was going to kill myself if it wasn't for you. I've, I've had people tell me that my whole life. And people say, like, you did this. And I'm like, I don't understand. So I know I had that gift. I had that ability. But as far as, like, managing people, I am not good because I'm either too nice or I'm super frustrated, you know? Yeah. I just don't like it either. I can't manage I, I hate managing people. I don't want to manage anybody. Yeah. Like, it's just like the idea of like, kind of MGTOW, it's like you're not trying to control anybody. Like I, I hate it, I don't even want to do it. 
I, I, I despise it. And I, and I don't want to become the person that is a good manager. Even though managers are great. I love managers. I would hire a manager in two seconds. Some people are very good at it. I had, I had you manager, know, I respect managers. Yeah, I had a managing position before. And the way I looked at it, I have to give people assignments. Yeah. And if they can't do it, I get upset. That's why I cannot be a manager. Because I'm right. trying to get people to do things for the company and be a little bit better. And yeah. just can do it. So I said, I cannot handle that type of position. Right. Uh, yeah. So I, I could I, see. I just could not yeah. handle it. I just didn't like it. Yeah. And I really don't think I was good. Like, I, I'm sure people didn't like me as a manager because I just was unpredictable yeah. and I didn't like what I was doing. And so people can feel that, right. you know, when you don't yeah. like what you're yes. doing, yes. That's what I they, they, yeah. they feel it. Right. So anyway, I thought, OK, what am I going to do now? And I was like, I do not want even though the machine building the machine was cool. And I mean, it wasn't a machine. It wasn't IBM. It wasn't Tesla. I mean, I, you know, just so you guys. But I it still to me, it was what I wanted to build, and I built it. So then I reevaluated. I'm like, I don't want to do that ever again. And also, I don't want to put myself, I don't want to be blackmailable uh, having my business taken from me, right? right? So that was where the unblackmailable came from. So I was like, I don't want someone to be able to destroy me with one, you know, easy move, you know, and yeah. take away everything. Because it took away everything, because not only did I lose the business, I lost all the revenue until now. And the girl who's doing it, she's still, you know what I mean? It's like, it was a real thing, right? So I, I lost all the connections with the great government officials in China that I had and, the, and all the rich guys. Like there was a lot of cool Chinese guys I, I met through this business. That was amazing, you know? And, and like I was shut off from them because of course they dealt with her. I was oh, ostracized. So you weren't the sole proprietor. You were just like a partner. Well, I started it, but then yeah. she was my operations manager. Yeah. And, and so, uh, what, but that's not the important. The important part is I was ostracized and out. Yeah. So I no longer had a visa. I no longer, I would have could have begged for it. She would have done it. Yeah. You know, she wasn't, she would have given me a visa probably if I begged, but I wasn't going to fucking beg for a visa after you steal something that's valuable that I built. Yeah. And she built it too, but still, fuck you. I, <laughs> don't I, don't do me any fucking favors. Like, I, right. I'll go do my own thing. Thank you very much, right? It's like your patent. Yeah, yeah I'm out of here. You know, so I was like, okay. So now I spent all this time learning Chinese. And I'm like, I, I got an apartment. I got the visa. I got the business. All the friends, the connections. I live in this certain area. And all of it was gone. Yeah. And I was on an airplane to Hong Kong. And I'm just like sitting in Hong Kong at my friend Eric's house. And I'm just like, fuck, what am I going to do? I actually got to Hong Kong and I had to throw away most of my stuff because I had like a lot of nice stuff. And so we were going to take a boat to Japan. That was the plan. So we took all my stuff in a truck down to the, because the boat, you could have unlimited stuff on it. Whereas the airplane, you couldn't. Mm -hmm. There was a boat to Southern Japan. Yeah. So, and then my friend was going to rent a truck and come pick us up. Mm -hmm. So basically I had all the stuff and I brought the truck down to the, down to the uh, ship, right, to take off. And then when we got there, the ship was there, and the guy said, you can't get on. And I'm like, why not? He said, well, tomorrow's a holiday, so everybody went home two hours early. And this, <laughs> so this is China. I'm like, the boat's right fucking there. He's like, yeah, but they're the guys who have to check you in. So and the, they're gone. Your girlfriend called them and said, don't so, come in. So I'm, no, 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 no. I just, that was China. Like, they yeah. just were not reliable. Yeah. Like, and they didn't give a shit. I'm yeah. sitting there with all my worldly belongings. Wait next you know, tons of shit. I got, like, golf clubs and, you know, expensive shit and leather jacket. I got all kinds of shit, right? You know, like, nice stuff yeah. sitting there all at the harbor. And I have nowhere to go because I just closed my apartment. Oh. There's no place to go back to. I just gave the keys to the landlord. <laughs> Like, I just got dropped off here, yeah, and the truck's this. gone, <laughs> and I'm sitting there with all my stuff, right? and then and the boat's gone, and the boat's not going to start running until, like, two weeks, because it's the biggest Chinese holiday two of the year. Two weeks? Yeah, it was, like, two oh, weeks till oh, the boat Jesus. was here. <laughs> so, I couldn't even, there was no, I couldn't, so I just called my friend Jason, I'm like, Jason, I need help. And he's like, I'm there for you. And he had a big apartment, and he goes, he had a three-bedroom, and he had, you know, so he's like, he had, a, he had a wife and kids, too, but he was like, he's a good friend. He's yeah. in Bali now. And Jason's like, dude... Don't even think a word about it. Just get this shit over to my house. So I got the shit over to his house, and I'm sitting in his house, and I'm so depressed. And then I realized, like, that we're going to fly now because he can't take the train, plane, right, the boat. Yeah. So now I really got to throw away most of my shit. 
So I'm just giving away valuable stuff. I'm throwing it in the garbage. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like valuable stuff. Like, you know, expensive stuff. Nice stuff that I like. Did you just give some of the stuff to Jason, though? I gave it to Jason. Yeah, you know, there's only so much you... You know what I mean? Yeah, you can only take so It's much a much timing stuff. and, you know, a surfboard. It's like stuff that, you know, you can't use in Shanghai. So anyway, I, uh, I threw most of my stuff away. I got on the airplane. And I, I still had a lot of stuff, though, as much as I can get. So I got to Hong Kong. You guys are going to crack up about this. So I get to Hong Kong. And we went... Uh, you know, I used to live in the Chungking Mansion when I was a kid. I used to go there all the time. Because it was $2.50 a night in the Nigerian dormitory, right? So that's where I stayed in the years back, right? Uh, me and these Nigerian guys. And so I got there, and I was going to go there, but I had this stuff. And it was Chinese New Year or whatever it was. It was the big holiday. So it must have been Chinese New Year. Yeah, it was Chinese New Year. And so they didn't have any rooms in the whole Chungking Mansion, which has millions of rooms. <laughs> and so I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so then I, my man Eric's like, come to my house. Take your stuff. So... I can't carry it. And Eric was working that day. And, and I got all the shit in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the airport. I'm like, fuck. So I, I saw, I knew these, these homeless guys in Hong Kong. They have these carts they use. There's these big metal carts and they're really sturdy. Yeah. And they use them to kind of like for their house and uh, just, I don't know, but they're just good sturdy carts. So I said to the guy I was with, I'm like, dude, I'm going to go rent one of those from the homeless guys. And he's like, he's like, dude, if you push that around, that's a homeless guy's push. I'm like, I don't give a shit. So I go to the homeless guy. I'm like, dude, listen, Chinese. Like, listen, you know, I'm like, fuck, I need one of these cards just for the day. I mean, I'll pay, pay your cash on the money, you know. And the dude's like, what? <laughs> he's like a foreigner speaking Chinese. You know, he's like, you want my card? What are you talking about? And I'm like, no, money. You know, I'll give you money now. And I'll give you more money later. I'll give you more than the things worth as a deposit, and, you know. And then, you know, and he's like, oh, okay. So he's like, I gave him the money. I took the cart and I put all my shit on there. And I'm walking around Hong Kong, pushing this fucking cart. I've already thrown away most of my stuff. Uh -huh. And now I'm sweating my ass off, pushing, you know, pushing all this shit around Hong Kong. I threw the bumpy roads and all the crowded sidewalks. And, this, this does really seems like very yeah. symbolic of that whole thing of like, you know, at some point where... Um, right. The you no longer own the stuff, the stuff owns you. Oh. Like this is like is the epitome of that sim that that look. It's like it's like it's all these Consumerism. anchors. It's like your total it's yeah. like they've become anchors and yeah. a nooses around your dude. neck as you're pushing it through. Dude, you're just, just like trapped. Dude, the feeling the Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah exactly. dude. The feeling was depression. I'm on, like walking around Hong Kong and I'm looking like a homeless. This is the last of my belongings. Yeah. And, and like people were like laughing. Like literally people were cracking up. Because like, this white guy, Melania, was walking by with this homeless card and all this shit on it. Right. Because right. yeah. it wasn't even like, like clean. Oh, looks it like wasn't you... nice luggage. It was like, you know, it was like duct tape boxes yeah. and fucking. It looked like you blend in. Whatever I could. Different race. <laughs> looks like yeah, so yeah, you I, blend in. Well, yeah. people were cracking up. Yeah, they, like and, and so we walked over to where all the Filipino maids uh, go on Sunday. It was a Sunday. So. And we walked over to the park there, and we just, like, I knew it was a good place. We could kind of sit down. You know, a lot of Hong Kong, there's no place to sit. It's so oh, busy. Oh, right. Yeah, so I got down to that park. I forgot what it's called. And then I just, we sat there for the day and just talked to Filipino maids mm -hmm. about things. And they saw all our stuff, and they were cracking up. Hong Kong people would stop us and just start laughing. Wow. And they're like, what? Nice. They're like, what happened? Like, how could we have this car? And I would tell them a story. They'd be just cracking up. They're like, never. <laughs> you, Hong Kong people were funny. They're like, Never start a business in China. Yeah. They'll teach you every time. Yeah. They're like telling me like yeah. all this advice. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, thanks. I was not surprised. If you had asked me that what was going to happen, I would tell you this. You'd end up here pushing a cart with all your stuff. That's I would have told you. That's who's going to end up. That's a, everyone knows how the story ends. Yeah. Uh, dude. So, so like, how did the new story begin? Okay, yeah. so well, but no, this is all part of it because I, you know, I had learned these lessons. I had paid the price in blood for my mistakes, right? <laughs> So now I'm like, okay, I went back to America. I can't live here. Yeah, I don't want to live here. So I, I tried to live in America, but I, I really didn't fit in. I didn't, didn't understand the people. They don't seem very disciplined here. They don't really try that hard. They don't, I, just, like, I just feel like everything's so easy here. I don't, you know what I mean? Like things are so handed to people. They don't, they don't really develop. It's hard to develop yourself if you're not pushed to do it, right? Mm. You really have to. I, I said this in the fight of your life. You got to be pushed to do I something. I think part of it's the educational yeah. system here too. That had that how I grew up. Right. You know, I'm like an immigrant. I came here when I was five. Yeah. And I got, you know, went through the 
educational system in America here, and then I don't think they push yeah. you hard enough. Oh yeah, yeah school they, they, like they fuck. Don't, they don't push you. It's, hard it's very bu- bubble wrapped. It's a very bubble wrapped experience school, for the most part. School in Japan, they, protect, is, they yeah. protect you from real life. Well, like let's put it this way: in Japan, there was a kid who was studying so hard. He was like he was in junior high school that he put two pencils in his nose, like a, a number two pencil. And he slammed his face on the desk and he killed himself with pencils through his nose oh, into his brain. I think that's a little bit like, too extreme. But, but that, yeah. that, that's how hard they yeah, study, that's, yeah, you know, that's and then it just drove him insane, you know. Right. And, you know, like that, the, the kids in Asia, man, they, they oh fucking got to compete with a lot more people than yeah, us here. More, more competition. It's, they, it's a, it was a lower quality of life. You were building up. There was more people. Uh, the education system was more strict and standard. Like I studied Chinese and like we we were in a room in the winter, it's snowing outside, no heater, single pane windows, usually open, wood wood chairs, you know, there was no heater, there was there was nothing. You're freezing your ass off. You're wearing like down jacket and big mitts and three hats in class, you know, while you're studying Chinese. So for like a long time. Sitting so, down for like three. So when you said four you came hours. back to the US and you saw that, you know, there's a lack of I I, I you know, yeah. Uh, lack of energy or something that lack of you, discipline lack of discipline so you didn't like it here yeah because... well I just I just I just couldn't you know it's like it's like I, yeah, I think it's something I mean it's not the same but I, I feel like it's kind of like some people go to war so and they come like back a, you're more like, like a go-getter oh. you're more like a go-getter and you just see like other people like a go-getter like you I'm not I am a, I'm not really because I don't really care about success that much either I like to do stuff and learn more than anything. Mm-hmm. Like I love to do stuff and learn. That's just, I love that, you know, and the experience that you get from doing stuff, you know, so I was just here, I realized I could succeed. It was easy, but it wasn't challenging. And I just thought I can't do it. I, I don't want to do it. And then when I saw like the politically correct stuff, because in China, you know, people talk about China, but I'll tell you something in China, when we would debate politics and stuff at night, like having dinner, there was a really good debate and they would listen to whatever I said. Like they would take in, you know, my opinion and they would say, they would like, like I, I feel like the level of debate in China was a thousand times better than here. Even today, people, Chinese people can be much more honest in debate about stuff and they're not trying to push it on you. Like there's actually debate is still a thing in China. But maybe mm. they're brought up that way through the yeah. educational level, and then they're they're more intellectual, so they could look at both sides. Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah, right. You have to look it's, at both. It's sides. a powerful yeah. skill, and it's an important thing, I think. Yeah. You know, whereas here, if you say one thing that's off, all of a sudden you're labeled this certain thing, and then you're just dismissed. You know, yeah, you're not and, open and, to see your point yeah. of view. Any yeah. opinions now yeah. is irrel- is like automatically null and void. They're like any of your opinions is wrong now. But but just keep in mind that this is dumb. Like you don't have yeah. to participate in life like this so i i was like kind of like how could this happen i'm like what happened to america you know oh, so uh, i'm like because oh, you had to teach because cuz i knew the old right. america too yes you know or right. my old you know yeah. old enough right because right. well, you had been gone for over 20 years at that point i had been gone for yeah a long time over 20 years at that yeah. point right and so so then so then i i thought okay i got to do something new and then uh, how it started was i got a call from my buddy Adam in Bangkok, and he's like, he's like, uh, dude, Bangkok is good, and, and Adam is super fucking smart. So when he says something, I listen, because he never talks anyway. So when he does talk, it's usually something meaningful. Mm-hmm. So when he said Bangkok, I'm like, dude, you know me. I don't like drink. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't like whores. Like that's all <laughs> Bangkok is. I don't want to go there. He's like, no, 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 no. You'll like it. Trust me. It's not about that. He goes, you're gonna like it. There's a lot going on here. I don't even know what he said, the words, but he basically knew me and he knew I didn't like that. But he's like, you'll like it. And I trusted him because that's the key thing. You have to have friends that they just say one word and you can trust it. Because he knew me well enough to know I would like the new Bangkok that was going on. You could fit in. Yeah, he knew that something, there was a, there was a niche for me in Bangkok. And I was like, okay. So I went and bought a ticket. I went and got, I went straight to the embassy the next day. I got a Thai visa. Uh, at the time, I think it was a six-month tourist visa. And then I went over there and I thought, okay, now I'm in a point where I've never been. I'm no longer, I'm no longer trying to fit into Japan. I'm no longer trying to be Japanese. I'm no longer trying to buy a house. I'm no longer trying to 
be rich and rich or whatever I was trying to do at certain times in my life. I'm no longer trying to build stuff because I built stuff and I realize it's kind of shackles for me. And I don't want to do this and I don't want I know I knew what I didn't want to do. So I'm like, okay. I told Adam, I said, I'm going to go to Bangkok. And what I'm going to do in Bangkok is think until I come up with something that I want to do. You're putting everything together in my life. So I thought, okay, I asked him how much it was. And he said, you could easily live here less than $1,000 a month. So like I, I said, I got some money so I could live there. And I could, like at least two years, I could just think right. and practice. And, and break. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 not a break. No, well, a brainstorm. Because I wanted right. to find something that I wanted to do. That made me excited, you know, right. and I'm like, I, it's not going to, it's going to take time. So I went to Bangkok, I rented uh, this very cheap room, it's 145 bucks a month, no window. And it was so cheap that even for Thais, it was cheap because uh, like it was all Thai college students. And there was also a lot of heroin addicts. So it was like I was living in this building, but I knew the owner because it used to be a youth hostel back in the day, that building. Mm. It was kind of like a guest house in the old days. Then it became like a heroin den, and then it became like poor college students. And so it was kind of a mix. It was kind of turning to college students. Right. And, and, you know, no and like, yeah, like ex prostitutes. And there was like that. I like seedy things, even though I don't do them. I like to be around the seedy part of town. I grew you can, up. You can learn a lot about life in yeah, your life. I grew up yeah. more around people like that than yeah. I did around True. New York, yeah. Fifth Avenue. Yeah. So I can relate to them more, I guess. you know. And so I'm like, so I'm like, and in China too, like most of my friends were like taxi drivers, guard men, you know, stands, you know, college students, like they weren't, you know, yeah, it was like the people I grabbed, that I felt affinity for, right? Yeah. So, so then, uh, uh, which is always interesting in Asia because that's not the way most foreigners are. Yeah. More foreigners are, are very different. They're very, I'm better, class. I have yeah. opportunity, you know. I can do this. I was like, I don't want any of that stuff because that's just fucking fool's it. gold. Yeah, Fuck that. Yeah. I don't want to be looked at like that because I'm not that. So I, I found, you know, I was true to myself on that, right? So anyway, so then in, in, in Thailand, I just, I just started to, you know, I rented that serviced office, which was $40 a year. So, so I'm still, yeah. so crazy. Sponsored by the Thai government and it was really beautiful. So every day, nine o'clock, I'd go there, I'd sit there and think. And I was just like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I want to do something online. You know, I want to do something online. Because I knew that the offline business would tie me to one place. And maybe I would need a partner would steal it again. You know, I don't want to do that again. So at least I learned my lesson, right? Don't have partners. Yeah, I didn't want, to, I didn't want an <laughs> offline business either. Because okay. once I got kicked out of China, I lost. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, if yeah. I would have lost my visa, even if she wouldn't have taken it, yeah, I would have lost the business the too. Yeah, it was tied down too. It was tied down. Yeah, right. So I'm like, no, and the internet's hot. I'm like, I want to do something on the internet. So I was sitting here thinking of stuff, and I thought, okay, what am I going to do? And my friends, I started to meet, I had started to meet guys who were teaching pickup over the years, you know, and, and, and they were making money. Like they were making like, some of them were making like a million dollars a year uh, doing courses and, and, and helping guys. Oh. I know a lot of guys don't understand that, but right. the, the men's thing. movement started with PUAs. Fuck everybody. Yes. That's where it started. I swear to God, we're stealing so many ideas from PUA and I MGTOW. Heard a guy named David you guys, D'Angelo. Yeah. David D'Angelo, yeah, you would not believe that, yeah. how many words that, that we use in the in the in our in the MGTOW community and the men's, you know, and, and all the uh, what is the other one? The, the, the men's, men's rights. rights move. Yeah. No, men's different. rights. Men's rights. That's that's you know, all the manosphere. No, but all the manosphere and all these groups. You would not believe how much shit we're ripping off of PUAs. Yeah. That's unique content. And right, it was they were the guys who were in the field testing out theories. Yeah, testing in so real they'd have life. A theory Taking and then the actually chance. take it out in the, and, and actually see and they'd like fail, they'd and, be willing to fail. Yeah, and, and also see what happened. they were the first guys that I know of that said I'm not happy with this, what society is giving me. Society's not giving me a fair deal. Mm-hmm. You know, because I I, you know, I am this kind of family, I am this kind of car, you know, and I'm limited to the level, for those guys, the level of women that, you know, basically low level chicks. And they're like, I want better. Fuck that. I want to go and build my, I want the best. 
I want to go and break through this bullshit. Society's giving me scraps, like a dog, giving me bones. And I want fucking meat, you know. And that was, the, that was really the heart of the PUA movement. It really was. I'm not saying everything was good. I'm not painting. I'm just saying that I know there was a lot of different people in it. The people you might know in PUA maybe would have more scumbags. But trust me, they were not all scumbags. There were some super cool guys in that group. And some of them are actually secretly in MGTOWN now, you know, that were in that movement. But anyway, they were the first guys. And so I was like, I wanted to do, I thought, okay, I could teach pickup, but I didn't want to pick up anymore. I wasn't interested in pickup. So I'm like, I, experience. but I, I could do it. So it I'm like, mostly you were kind of in a different phase in your life at that yeah. point. Well, but, but, but I had already met all the PUAs. And then at that point, I realized if I did a PUA course, I would be kind of, kind of ripping off my friend right. because right. my friends were doing it. Right. And I didn't, even though it's not really ripping them off, I mean, it's a new business, but I didn't even want to compete with them. Like I like to support people and I don't like to rip anybody off who helps me. And they had been very cool to me. And I thought, I don't want to compete before, against them. So. Yeah. No, 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 no. I just didn't want to. I felt they owned that. Right, right. It was their thing. It's they their, had built it. Idea. I had it. done it in Japan on, yeah. on its own, but not as a business. Yeah. They had built it up as a business, and it was a cool thing. And I, I was like, that's cool. But well, I don't want to You compete. like doing your own thing that's different than what the rest of Well, it's of not that. Do. I don't want to rip people off. So yeah. It's just like this. Like, I, I don't want to just copy, you know, another person you know, I want to encourage you to do your thing and you did your thing. I don't want like you're around, you come up with a good idea, then I want to do it. I'm well, like, no, yeah. that's I think, your I think idea. The experience you had in China where you had an idea and someone took it from you and now you came back. And Maybe, you that's their idea. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. I've been ripped be, off a lot. Right. You don't want to burn them because yeah. someone burned you. And also I know the complexity of ripping yeah. off too because, you know, like let's say you're a painter and then somebody just starts painting and they're making kind of like, they got a gallery near you and maybe not exactly the same, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. same genre. Yeah. You're ripping the guy off yeah. at the end of the day. You're, you know, but, 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 you're taking clients that he would get, you know, and I never want to do that to people that help me. Well, you're that's moving. part of it. You know? That's part of it. But also, you know, I think it sounds to me that you all along your, your track record was showing that you te- had a tendency to always try to do something different. Right. Even so, when you created that, fresh. when you said when you're at that real estate seminar, no, but I didn't do it on purpose. I know you didn't do it. Yeah, but I'm yeah, saying I that, didn't know. I know, but I'm saying I think that just it from what I understand of you, your personality in general, that that's just kind of how you just you tend to gravitate towards doing something different, something new. But I think you had another reason for why to do it different. Yeah, the reason but I think is because you, already, you were already someone that would just do things yeah, differently because you were always doing things differently. I just think it's very weak to copy people. Yeah, I don't so like it. That's, like, that's why I don't yeah, like yeah. I don't like channels that that they're essentially copying other channels. Yeah. So it's about being yeah. original. Yeah, I, just, original. Yeah. I, I consider them bullshit, basically. Try, yeah. 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 If you're not coming up with unique ideas, it's bullshit. Like, I don't like it. So, yeah, I don't, I never, that's like that's selling right. your soul. I don't want to, no fucking way. Right. So, so then I'm like, okay, I can't do that. I don't want to, so I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? And then I came across a MGTOW channel. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what the fuck is MGTOW? Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So then I started listening and I thought, yeah. Because I was never, I was never pure, PUA. I've always been a more balanced person. Like I always had ideas about what's fair for people and things like I always thought about stuff like this. It wasn't like the first time. And also the books I read, like Predatory Female, Manipulated Man, these were the books I read in like way back, in like 1991. So this is really the beginning of MGTOW type stuff. You know, this was when, when guys were figuring out that they were being scammed. Not only were they not privileged, but they're being ripped off and used. You know, their their workhorses, slaves to the end for nothing, no benefit. And like, and she's like saying, "Don't be a slave, don't do that." It's not about freedom. It's like for her, it's like, "Don't be a slave. You're you're just a workhorse. You're just a dumb mule for for a fake nothing. She doesn't care about you. There's nothing there for you. You're just a dummy working away for nothing. Yeah. You're trading something valuable." Your life for nothing. And you're going to end your life and having given away the one thing that you had that was valuable. That's right. essentially what she was saying. going along with just the hope that it would somehow work out or somehow, somehow get better. Society's dreams yeah. would come true and a De Beers ad would suddenly be real for you. But yeah. it wasn't real. And so she was saying, like, don't be a fucking fool. That's what she was saying. Mm-hmm. Right. So that is what I was into. 
And that's what motivated me to do pickup. See, it was the opposite. I started MGTOW in a way. Because I was like, I was like, I don't want to be used. I don't want to be full. And at the same time, I don't want to use other people. So that makes it difficult. So a lot of people were like, oh, I don't want to be used. So, so well, I'll just use everybody use else. Yeah. They, they were going to use me anyways, so I'm going to use them first. Yeah. It's kind of like, I'll beat them to the punch. Right, right. So they take, and I'm like, I don't want to use them. I don't want to be used. So fuck that. So, so. so then I got into, you know, pick up, but I always knew that the heart of, you know, the heart of what I was doing was predatory female, manipulated man, nice guys don't get laid, and these kind of books that really influenced me a lot, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I read a lot of the other books that influenced me that were recommended at that time, which I can't really remember the time. Now, like novels that were related to those books. Related, they were like recommended by those authors. So, yeah. so then I'm sitting there, and so here's where the story really starts. Okay. So I'm in Bangkok. And I'm like at my house. I'm getting frustrated. I've been trying to come up with ideas. I'm living in this shitty little room. Everybody else I know is trying to build something, like a job. They're trying to get a visa. And I'm just sitting there by myself. I'm 50-something years old. You know, I'm like almost 50 or whatever I was. Let's see. I was 50. Yeah, I had to be 52 or whatever, 51. So I'm like sitting there. I'm like, fuck, you know, what am I going to do? Or is, No, no, I was probably 49 actually. And I'm like, what am I going to, what am I doing? Like, I'm so old to be a YouTube, because I was starting to think about YouTube, you know, because Pickup was YouTube. Yeah. Really. And then I was like, man, what am I going to do? Like, I I can't, I don't really have the tech skills. And so I was like, ah, fuck, you know. So anyway, I was in my apartment. I was frustrated. And then I I, I went to Limpini Park, and I was like, I remember exactly where I sat. I remember exactly this little bridge. And I was sitting there. And all of a sudden, I thought, I had something I wanted to say all of a sudden. And I thought, you know what? Because if people were like saying like, you know, and the manipulated man was women are dangerous. And on my first idea, if you listen to my first two videos, I was kind of saying guys are more dangerous. That they, like a jealous man, an envious guy mm-hmm. is more dangerous to you than a woman. Because they can really destroy you. And that's what my first two videos are really about if you go back and listen to them. Mm. And it was like, you got to be careful. Protect yourself. Some people are envious of you. They try to take things away from you. And I don't remember the exact message. You can go listen to them. But that's what I remember of my first so two videos. Men are more devious than females. Well, it wasn't that women are more devious. More dangerous. It's, it's more dangerous because, because, because the emotion of envy and jealousy are more dangerous emotions. People will kill for that. And they do. Yeah. They, yeah. If you're envious of another man, like you think his, you know, he's got more going on, whether it's, you know, physically or whatever guys will go crazy because that makes them feel small and I've always I've always been a guy who is not I've been able to overcome my jealousy always Mm -hmm. you know I've always been good at controlling it and like not letting it get the better of me and and when people are jealous of me it's always been a letdown every time I'm like fuck another guy can't it's like you know they don't realize it's good to have cool friends like, you don't want to have loser friends. And if you have cool friends, you're going to be jealous. Like, you're going to have, they're going to have stuff you don't have. Right. So, you, you know, you have to deal that as a man. See, that's not good. And a lot of guys can't. You see they're not. above you. Yeah. And then you don't want to be near them. Right. Right. You don't want to be there because you're, because you're, you're feeling envy and jealousy. And so what that does is that limits your life. Mm-hmm. So you can only be around people who are losers. And then yeah. you have loser friends. But, and then you are, you know, what the people you hang out with, the ideas. The, you know, the, the things you do, right? And that because just... Because of your fear of feeling... Uh, because of your... You you, want because to be, of envy. You, because you're not... You, you can't deal you, with feeling the feelings of envy. Or, you then limit and kind of lock yourself into this perpetual oh. cycle of only being with loser friends or at least friends well, that aren't any and, better and, than you. And not just that, but you, you now have, let's say, in some way undermined, whether it's talking bad about somebody when they're not there. You've done something to deliberately harm somebody who is a good person, but you were just envious of them. So they, now you have baggage. So you feel now you have secrets. You have right. secrets. Right. You know, you're kind of like not a trustworthy guy anymore. Mm-hmm. And you know it. Yeah. And so that makes you feel more like a worm. And then you yeah. become more of a worm. Then you're like, you know, like it's, 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 a, it's a low down thing. It's just you go lower and lower. 
And then that's how guys become total sleazebags. And that's why a lot of guys can't be trusted. Because they can't just clean the slate and say, I fucked a guy over. I was envious. You know what I mean? I was, I I, I could not handle my emotions, you know, and that kind of stuff. That's, a man has to be able to say that. I had that in high school. And to, yeah, to be able to face that in himself, right? And, And so I made those first two videos about that. But the key with Ronin Man is it started with, I had something I thought was really important to share. say, yeah. Yeah. and I said it. And so then I made the one video, and then the second video, I mean, you can listen to it. To me, they're like the same message. So I felt kind of dumb because I'm like, the second one's the same as the first. So after you started, so, you kept continuing. You no, know? no, no. I made the first video, and then I'm like, okay, that was fun. Okay. I'll make another that one. Fun. But then I felt like it was the same as the first one. Okay. So I'm like, that's dumb. I thought, I don't have anything else to say. So um, I made those two videos. You have and I, to say. Yeah, yeah, I put them online. That's it. And yeah, that's what I felt when yeah. I was with you before. I yeah. Had to say. I was like, I don't have anything else to say. That's, <laughs> I, all my ideas are gone. Yeah. So then, so then uh, we'll go back to Ronin Man name because that, that was before that. So then, so then I, uh, I had this young friend uh, from Israel, Devere. And Devere was really trying to do something himself. Right? He was trying to find something. And he was motivating me. And he was like very young. He's like 22. He's super fucking smart. And, and like we were kind of helping each other out. He's, he's a good looking guy. He's good at pickup. He's like six foot three. Oh, he's 22. Yeah. yeah, he's a stud. He's, he's like, yeah, he's a cool guy. Like he's got no issues with any yeah. stuff. He can just talk about anything. If you succeed, he's like, oh, that's great, Paul. You know, yeah. you made him. Like, that's great. You know, yeah. he never, he's like. Very positive. And I, yeah, I, very young. Yeah, and yeah. He, he wasn't envious. He wasn't that tight, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and that was great. I love yeah. that. So I'm like, me and Devere, we're just like planning ideas, come out with things. And then, and then, so then I, 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 I said I made the videos, yeah, because I, I guess I had talked about it. And I said, oh, he said, send them to me. So I sent them to him. And then I go, I go, yeah, but the second one is dumb. It's the same as the first. And he's like, I think they're fucking great. He goes, I just listened to him. He goes, I think they're fucking fantastic. And I was like, so you kind of and I was like, really? Yeah. I, and I go, well, I don't really have anything else to say, though. He goes, he goes, oh, don't worry. I'll just ask you questions in the next one. And so I was like, oh, okay, that's easy. So then I met him, and then he asked me questions. And then if you listen to the original videos, it's him asking me questions, right? Mm. right. And, and just kind of... you a question, you know how to answer it. It's, yeah, I know how to answer it. Yeah. So then, yeah. You know, just like, boom. Right. It's not scripted. You could just, yeah, like if you ask me a question. It's like at a summit, you know? Yeah. 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 Right. So I could tell you everything, but I, I couldn't say it if you didn't ask me that one question. Right. It really helped. He was a good interviewer, too. Right. Yeah. So he was really good at pulling stuff out. Yeah, right? stuff out. Yeah. And, then, and so that was one thing. And if, if, you, if I really tell the story, there's one other thing that was key that was really fundamental before this is I was uh, hanging out with my buddy uh, from Germany, the, the videographer, right? And he's like super cool, Demi. So, so Demi was visiting me one day and we were sitting in the park next to Prompong Station and, and he's like super cool. Like he's like fucking good looking guy, total stud. He like great musician. He's a, he, he was a videographer for MTV. Like, he's, like, got talent to burn. He's a funny guy. He's, like, confident like crazy. He's a good friend. I had been on the, on the, the pickup tour for three months with him. So we were on the road because I helped the pickup artists go around America. So he was a videographer, and so was me. I had volunteered to do this when I came home from America for a short trip. And I got to know him quite well, and I realized this guy is, like, really cool, like, through and through. Even when we haven't slept for six days... And you know what I mean? We haven't eaten, and we're in a hurry, and then we lost this, and we forgot yeah. to do that. And then he's still cool. I mean, you know, we're tired, but he's still cool. And I like people that have been tested. Mm-hmm. Demi was tested. Right, right. So, he's not, he doesn't start bitching and moaning and complaining no. about everything. And if he does, he's going to make fun of himself. Like, right. you know what I mean? He's, yeah. he's, he's, there's no weirdness with him. That's what I, my friend Eric always calls it weirdness. Like a lot of guys, you get with him, and there's going to be weirdness at some point. And Eric's like, I never want to be around anybody who's weird like that. And I'm like, well, that's a yeah, good way to think about it. Change. That's what well, it is. Yeah. Like yeah, said, no. yeah I, I hang out with people. Sometimes their personality change. Yeah. Yeah. Like weirdness. You know, that's well, weirdness. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's weirdness. I, yeah. I, yeah. You name it weirdness. And you know, like when I right. go out and drink with some people. Yeah. We're cool for the first few hours. Then after they drink, they become violent. Oh, there's that too. The, the yeah, mean drunks. The mean the, drunks. Yeah. The, yeah. Weirdness. Okay. Yeah. There's that's weirdness true. in drinking, but there's also yeah. weirdness just with okay. guys who get tired Yes. Or yeah, you know, they start yeah. becoming really cranky. Yeah. Or, or the or tantrums. Change. Sure. Change. Yeah. Or, or something makes them look, you know, bad, yeah. and then they they, they feel oh. they have to prove themselves. Oh, yes. Whatever the fuck, yeah. they don't have gotcha. a robust gotcha. base as a man. Right? Yes. And so Demi does. So Demi was like, 
we were sitting there talking, and Demi goes, he goes, man, he goes, I could literally move here and just listen to you talk all day, every day. And Demi was super cool. And for him to say that, mm-hmm. I was like, I was like, what? I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. I was like, why? He goes, he goes, you should just talk all the time. I want to hear you just keep talking, right? And I was like, and coming from Demi, I, my mind was fried. I left. I went home. I'm like, why would Demi say that? Like, what do I have to say? What? You know? And so then when the video idea came up and I started to think about making videos, I remember Demi. So I had faith in myself a little bit because I'm like, Demi said that. Not some idiot, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck. Maybe I had maybe his opinion mattered. Yeah. Too. Yeah, because maybe because he was he, because he was a good thinker. Like right. he was actually saying something real, and he wouldn't say it to to bullshit me. Right. I knew that. Yeah. So I'm like, I must have stuff I I haven't gotten out of me yet. Yes. Yeah, so I must have some ideas that I haven't really. I couldn't see myself that I had yes. these ideas. Correct. And he could see it. Yes. And so I thought, well, I can't talk to him all day, but I could record things. So I recorded the videos. I sent them to Demi. And then I sent them to you know my Devere, and, and then check it out for, yeah, and they were like, "These are fucking great." Yeah, right, right. And so that's when it took off. The name Ronin Man was after Demi said that, and then I thought, I, I can't make pickup. And then I saw MGTOW, and I thought, these guys don't know anything about women, you know, the original MGTOW guys. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. I I have a lot of experience with women, so I can yeah. I can be the one guy in MGTOW who actually knows women, like. That's what I was thinking to myself. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I have the same attitude because I started with MGTOW. I started with predatory female yeah. and manipulating man. So I'm like, I've been doing this a long time. So, you know, I'm like, not only do I have that as a base, but also I've been with a lot of women. I actually know they're actually not like what they're saying. Yeah. And they're much yeah. more complex yeah. than that. Yes. And I thought, I got to bring some truth. You have real, real I, experience. I have a lot of truth that I can bring yes. to this, to this wow. night, niche, I was thinking, you know. So I thought, well, I think I can teach a lot of things while I'm not doing pickup and ripping off my friend. Perfect. Yeah. I'll try it. So I made the videos and then people started asking questions. Oh, and then the Ronin Man name. Yeah. So between the Demi and those first two videos, I was trying to think of a name and then I was talking to, to my buddy in Bangkok and I, I came up with, I said, you know, these, these make guys, they're basically Ronins. You know, they're, and it's because you had spent all 16 years in Japan. Yeah. You had just become... Really- well, I knew what a ronin was. I'm like, yeah. oh, they're yeah. basically the Japanese concept of ronins, kind of. Oh, yeah. They're going their own way. You know, they're not just yeah, yeah. going with society. Like, they're... Yeah. And they're radical. Some of them ended up being criminals. They ended up being, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of mercenaries. You know, all kinds of stuff. You know, and, and like, I thought some of them were like blackmail, almost, you know, mafia guys. So they went different ways. But... They were Ronins and they were not doing things for a leader that they didn't. Uh, it wasn't their ideas. He told them, you do this. We're going to have this war. And they didn't decide what they were going to do. They would just take orders and they follow orders. They took orders and followed orders. Yeah. So the Ronins were like, no, I'm going to go on my own and figure it out. Right. And they're going to make mistakes. We're going to do it on their own. So the so, word you described them. So I'm like, I'm like Ronin is yeah. the perfect name for this group. Yeah, so I'm like, so I tried to get Ronin.com, but that was taken by some cartoon. So then I saw Ronin. So then I liked, at the time, I, I think I was listening to Sandman when I started. Right? Sandman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sandman he was, was, yeah, he was very he was big back then. in that, yeah. Sandman was huge. He was, he was a regular. And, yeah, he was a he's regular. He's still a regular. He still records every Yeah, day. and he, he, was, he was creating a lot of content. And so I, I thought, uh, well, he's Sandman and oh. we're men. So I thought, I'll be Ronin Man. <laughs> Yeah, so that's how I came up. With, that's how I came up with the idea. So yeah, it's just perfect, right? Yeah. and it's a little bit of a like compliment to him too. Yeah, because it's like, yeah, yeah Sandman sure. is a good yeah. name. Yeah. yeah, okay, Ronin Man. Yeah. So I never said this before. It's the first time. So then, so then, uh, I so then I uh, made the channel. I bought the dot com, right? Yeah. And then I, you know, and then I started making the videos. And then, and then uh, after that. Oh, and also like yeah. you just add one more thing where yeah. you were thinking about calling it. Ronan Migtow, and then one of your friends, yep. he kind yeah. of stopped you and said, Oh, no, 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 no. and then to tell yeah. that. Is well, I was gonna call it uh, Ronan Migtow originally before Ronan Man, and I was well, no, actually, I came up with like six or seven names that I liked, yeah. and one of them was Ronan Migtow, mm-hmm. which is my Gmail, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, and then, yeah, yeah Ronan Migtow, gmail.com, and then uh, Ronan and Ronan Man, and I wasn't sure, I had a bunch of other names, and then I wasn't sure which name was the best, and then. My, my buddy Adam is a domainer. 
So he's very, very, very good. He'll buy a domain for ten bucks, sell it for seven thousand. Mm-hmm. So he really is good at picking domains, really yeah. good. And so I said, I said, what do you? Simple. Yeah, and I, I, I trusted him. I had a friend who was highly skilled at, at what I needed, and I asked him which ones you get, and he goes, Ronan Man for sure. The other ones are dumb. He goes, that's the only one, Ronan Man. He goes, you might leave MGTOW. Who knows? Yeah, you so may leave MGTOW. Yeah. yeah, he goes, he goes, I don't know what that is, but it's probably not you anyway. He goes. So just go run a man, then you can do your own thing later or whatever. Yeah, you may be in MGTOW, you may you leave might. MGTOW, you may like, yeah. you're kind of he, in He didn't even know, he didn't really didn't know what MGTOW was, but yeah. he just said, why attach yourself? Yeah. It's kind of like, it's kind of like Jane feminism. Yeah. yeah Instead of permanently yourself. attached you're, to you're, that. You have to do, yeah. she has to do feminism videos now. And the next yeah. thing Whereas, you know, if that movement moves off into a totally different direction over time, she has no and then control. you're not, then you're you're now permanently attached to it, and now you're forced to have to do a complete rebranding later. Yeah, which is yeah. really damaging. So he was really smart. And he goes, he goes, I, he goes, one one hundred percent get Ronan Man. So I bought the domain right then, and then that was it. And then I made the videos. I made the first two. They had good reaction, and then people started asking me questions, and then it just grew really fast. Until YouTube started shadow banning me, you know, uh, I was growing really fast. Like, I should probably have 200,000 subscribers by now. Because I was growing real fast. Mm-hmm. And then I got, a, I got a stupidest complaint on the video. And then they just, I, I think it's kind of almost illegal what they did. Because they didn't even give me a strike. They just gave me a warning. And I thought the warning was bullshit. It wasn't even real. But that was it. The end of my growth of my channel. And that was like three years ago now. So my channel hasn't grown in three years, you know. So yeah. it was really taking off. And MGTOW was taking off. Well, so even if they took the shadow ban off now, it wouldn't be the same because, you know, MGTOW was exploding. And my content was getting heard. Yeah. It, was, it was really, you know, I was, I was getting to be, you know, somebody that it's people very relevant. listen it's to. very relevant. Yeah, what yeah. you yeah. say is very relevant. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so I felt like, yeah, I felt like this is meaningful, right? Yeah, yeah and people are enjoying this and they're learning. And so then that, that's kind of how it started. Then, then at that point, it gets to the point where you're kind of like, almost like a, a river washes you away at that point. It's not even you. The river starts to take you along the business that you should be on. Because it's either, mm. if, you, <laughs> but, you know, if, you're, if you're always trying to do yourself and you're always alone and you're always like, no matter what, I'm never going to quit. You're probably in the if wrong business. You're just business. pushing and pushing and like. You're written. probably in the wrong business. Like, yeah, the you're way probably you, in the nine out of ten that fail. It's the truth. So. Yeah, there should be some kind of a momentum and a wave that's coming. Al- you're going with the current, like a sailing metaphor. You're, you're going along, yeah. and you're not just like fighting to keep going. It's like the current starts just taking you too. It's, it's a tough, very tough call because, of course, it's very hard to start a business. Of course, you feel alone. Of course, it's hard. Of course, it's not easy when you get ra- even when the river's there. It's difficult to know when you're in that stage. But as you said earlier, before the, we started, it's the friends that you bounce ideas off that yeah. made the difference. Adam came up. He said, "Pick Ronan and Man," and then Devere had the questions. He, Demi said, "I like he to hear you." You know, you and all the pickup stuff. artists yeah. taught me that you could make a video channel and your message could be heard even if it wasn't acceptable on mainstream media, yeah. you know? Because right. they were the first ones to say a very unacceptable thing. They eventually got shut down, but, yeah. um, but they yeah. got a lot out of that while they were going, but you, you know? Yeah. Then what I think, you, you have to appreciate the technology that we have now with YouTube and someone's created this to get our, your message out to the world. Right. right, even though YouTube's not perfect and yeah, they, no, and they but, shadow ban me and everything, but, I still have appreciation but, for YouTube. Yeah, but you have the technology. Yeah. Somebody built that for you to tell your, you know, tell your story. Right, So I right. really appreciate that. Right, and, it, and they no, keep no, it running every day and like yeah. today they're doing it. it, it now, yeah. I have mixed feelings because I, I really think they should take the shadow ban off my channel. Yeah. I, I think it's outrageous. But, but honestly, maybe it's time to just make another sister channel where you're kind of repackaging some of your things and just like try to bypass the whole thing maybe have i it started will. again because that's what i've seen other art, other youtubers have done where they had one channel that was completely taken down and they just started a brand new one and changed the name what? just slightly or added a number a numerical number like running man two or something yeah. and suddenly that one doesn't have it's not capped off like the other ones and suddenly 
and you encourage people from the first channel, hey, go subscribe right now to my go new channel. There. And because suddenly a wave of subscribers hit, that the algorithm it causes it to suddenly get shot out to everybody. And then all of a sudden the thing blows way up even faster than the first well, channel. Well, right, to, to, right. That's but, something. That's a great story. Yeah. yeah. But to be on a selfish note, I do like your channel with the limited amount of people because all the comments is less than 100. Because if you had 1,000, I would not read through it all. Because it's I love the much. comment section. No, no, right I learned there. a lot from yeah. the comments too. No, that's very intimate for people who can't really see your, you know. But but just just but, just have faith that when there's more men, the more guys get together, good things will happen. Like yeah. there's more men, there's more ideas, there's more power, there's 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 more variety, there's more uh, like critical thinking, you know. There's more different backgrounds, you know. Like it might be. You know, we might get 100,000 Indians, you know, and really India can go crazy because <laughs> India is really growing, right? right, right. And MGTOW is really growing in India. So, you know, that could bring a whole right. new aspect. So I, I say, yeah, true. I I'm say I'm, I'm open to the growth and I'd like the summits to get bigger. Now, they will change. If they do get bigger, they will change. We'll have a different format a little bit. But I like but, the intimacy of the 10, of to, course. 10 to 20 people. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you're, you're one of the guys in the very middle. And yeah. that, that will never change. Like the, the whole plan I have with the nonprofit is that kind of you guys in the beginning are kind of are like pro- part of, you know, you guys are part of building this thing, right? right. You know what I mean? So with the nonprofit, it's going to be, it's, it's a, you know what I mean? It's, it's, there's, there's definitely... Things so to maybe do. Maybe it's gonna be called like the the Ronin Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that great name. That could be the name of the that's, new that's channel. That's perfect. The Ronin Mafia. The Ronin, Ronin Mafia. Mafia. <laughs> Ronin Mafia. That's the new channel. And actually, you could start the new channel as a parallel to your existing one. Help cause a bunch of people to move over, but then immediately the first topics on the new channel will be more, a little bit more tailored to this organization, this new organization you want to create. Possibly. We'll see. We'll see. But anyway, these are great ideas. And, you know, I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, so let's meet up and we can keep debating this. Let's let's meet up uh, January. So it'll be 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th is going to be the summit. And those are the official days. But in case you didn't really get it, those other days are really important. So if you can come longer, not only are they awesome, we're going to have blast, like for sure. But the other thing is too, like just on the selfish side of San Francisco, San Francisco is a killer city and it's super expensive to come here for a fucking week for 400 bucks. That's crazy. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> that's one night, you know, for my parents when and they come great. here. It's like, you know, like bring your sleeping bags, bring in mattresses. Like we'll have some extra mats and different things. But definitely yeah. if you already have your favorite sleeping bags or your different favorite uh, camping mats or whatnot, we've got lots of different floor space, a couple of different rooms. And it's just going to be like one big slumber party, you know, of all of us guys here. And it's, uh, and it's just an awesome space. Yeah, bring bring stuff to, to, to sleep. And there's really not much else. So anyway, I hope this has been a good episode for you guys. And thank you two very much for doing the fist bump here. You're welcome. Yeah, that was you guys. That was awesome. (laughs) Thanks, guys.